NAGPRA is a human rights statute. It is a process. It's a tool. Level playing field uh, and uh, bring the ancestors back home. It's about relationships. NAGPRA is civil rights legislation. NAGPRA itself outlines the expectation of tribes and museums. A reconciliation that they were not collectibles, that they were not specimens, but they were, uh, they were uh, ancestors of people who are alive now. Good afternoon, Lenton Museum. This is Michelle. Good morning, Michelle. May I speak with Museum President Winston Hyde, please? May I ask who's calling? Uh, yes, this is Bob Palmer calling. I'm the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act investigator with the Department of Interior. One moment, please. Hello, Winston Hyde. Oh, good morning, Mr. Hyde. Uh, my name is Bob Palmer, and I'm with the Department of Interior. And I'm the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act investigator. And I'm calling regarding an, an allegation that's been made against the museum, and I'm wondering if you'd have a few minutes to talk to me. Uh, yeah, I guess so. This is a fairly typical sequence of events in a NAGPRA civil penalty investigation. And from the museum's perspective, it's the beginning of a process that it probably didn't expect to be in. And from the party that made the allegations perspective, these investigations often represent the culmination of events that have happened over many years. Hello, my name is Bob Palmer and welcome to the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act Civil Penalties Program. This program will take us through the NAGPRA civil penalty and investigative process. We'll talk about the ways in which a museum can fail to comply with the act, how to file an allegation against a museum, the museum's rights in a proceeding, and finally, what's involved in the civil penalty phase of the process. As you may know, NAGPRA was created to address the rights of lineal descendants, Indian tribes, which includes Alaska Village Corporations, and Native Hawaiian organizations. For short reference, I may refer to any one of these groups as a tribe. The act provides a way for these groups and individuals to gain control of the human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony that they may be affiliated with. Both museums and federal agencies are required to comply with the Act, but the civil penalty provisions, which is what we will be talking about in this program, only apply to museums. Now, as you may already know, NAGPRA consists of several parts, and museums that possess items covered under the Act must undertake certain activities. For example, consulting with affiliated groups is part of compliance, as is completing inventories and summaries. The repatriation of human remains and cultural items, when appropriate, is also another part of compliance. When a museum does not meet one of the requirements, they fail to comply with the Act and are subject to a civil penalty. Now, as we'll discuss in this program, a finding that a museum has not complied with the Act and the issuance of a civil penalty is not an arbitrary decision made in some windowless government office at a remote, undisclosed location. It usually means that communications between a museum and a tribe has broken down, and this process is intended to foster compliance. Now, contrary to what I've heard while doing some investigations, civil penalties are not the government trying to get at a museum. Civil penalties are simply a tool that's used to achieve compliance with the law. And as a tool, it's only used when compliance has not come about voluntarily. Now, as we'll talk about, for a museum to be issued a civil penalty, it must be found to have done, or in some cases, not done something very specific. As I sometimes tell staff from museums that I'm investigating, there are no penalties for knowing your responsibilities and following the law. But as in life, you can be penalized for misunderstandings. So with this program, I hope to increase the level of NAGPRA knowledge and reduce the need for civil penalties. Here now are the eight actions that can lead to a museum not being in compliance with NAGPRA and potentially being assessed a civil penalty. A penalty can be assessed if a museum sells or transfers NAGPRA items, does not complete a summary, does not complete an inventory, or does not notify tribes within six months of completing an inventory. 
Penalties can also be assessed for refusing to repatriate, repatriating prior to publishing a notice in the Federal Register, or not consulting with lineal descendants, Indian tribes, or Native Hawaiian organizations. Finally, a museum could be penalized for failing to inform recipients that repatriated items have been treated with pesticides. As the NAGPRA investigator, a common question that I often hear is this, is the act ever enforced? And how often are museums found to have violated it? Both of these are very good questions. As some background, I can tell you that between 1996 and 2008, that there were 130 allegations of failure to comply made against 42 museums. Of these claims, 19 of them alleged a sale or transfer of items contrary to NAGPRA, 10 alleged a failure to, to complete a summary, 32 alleged a failure to complete an inventory, 9 alleged a failure to notify tribes within 6 months after having completed an inventory, 26 alleged a museum refused to repatriate, 5 alleged that a repatriation had occurred prior to publishing a notice in the Federal Register, and 28 alleged that a museum had failed to consult with tribes or lineal descendants. Lastly, there was one allegation received that claimed the museum had failed to inform the recipients that the repatriated items had been treated with pesticides. 2008, 70 of these allegations made against 18 museums were investigated and disposed of. They were disposed of by either finding that the allegation was substantiated or determining that the initial claim was unsubstantiated. Now, if you look at the data, there are two really interesting and seemingly contradictory trends. First of all, a majority of the allegations made against museums are not substantiated. But most museums that are investigated are found to have failed to comply with the act in some way. How could this be, you might ask? Well, the numbers don't lie. It just depends on how you choose to look at the issue. If we look at museums, we find that a full 78% of those investigated have either failed to comply with the act or are not yet in compliance. This to me as an investigator suggests that if someone has taken the time to file an allegation, there may be something to it, even if the number of allegations is overstated. On the other hand, if you look at the actual allegations, only about 32% are eventually substantiated. So what's going on? My belief is this. Most allegations have a tremendous amount of merit, but those who make the allegations are often alleging the wrong thing or are making more allegations than what the facts may support. Some of this may be due to the newness of the civil penalty process in action. But as you may imagine, investigating allegations takes time and money. In many cases, it takes more time to investigate what turns out to be an unsubstantiated allegation than it does to investigate a substantiated one. Allegation letters that are specific and are well targeted to one of the eight ways a museum can fail to comply with the act help me to conduct a thorough investigation in a timely manner. So if you want your allegation investigated promptly and efficiently, watch this program carefully and learn how to make your letters clear and concise. And if you don't want to be visited by me in person, there's also some things here that can help you as well. So let's begin looking at the act itself and the civil penalty process. When Congress passed and President George Bush signed the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act on November 16, 1990, the law included provisions for the Secretary of the Interior to create regulations that allowed the assessment of penalties against museums that failed to comply with the act. The regulations, which can be found at 43 CFR 10.12, were published as a final rule in 2003. Since 2006, the National Park Service Division of Law Enforcement, Security, and Emergency Services has carried out the civil penalty investigations. We're now at a point in time where we can draw on our investigative experiences and provide you with some real-life cases to learn from. These cases will give you a better picture as to how the civil penalty process works from start to finish. Now, while the basic facts surrounding the cases you are about to see are real, the names of the museums, tribes, individuals, and locations are fictional. Keep in mind that the objective of this program is education and the goal is compliance with the law. 
The goals that I have for this segment are the improvement of the quality of the allegations that I receive and to raise the level of awareness of the civil penalty process and help museums stay ahead of allegations with compliance rather than enforcement. Concerning compliance, at this point in time it can happen in one of two ways. One way is if you are a museum and you have some outstanding NAGPRA obligations, you act now and avoid receiving a call from me. The National NAGPRA office can help and that office does not file complaints against museums. As you will see in the upcoming cases, allegations come from members of the public, museum employees, and of course tribal governments. If you choose not to follow the voluntary path, then it's probably only a matter of time before someone makes an allegation against your museum and then it's too late to claim voluntary compliance. It's always best to come into compliance sooner rather than later, but especially before a finding of failure to comply. As you will see, early compliance can greatly reduce the amount of the penalty. So now it's time to begin our journey into the world of NAGPRA civil penalties. Who can file an allegation? Any person may file an allegation of failure to comply. The allegation doesn't have to come from an Indian or Native Hawaiian organization or even a Native American. It can come from anyone with knowledge of facts that tend to show that a museum has failed to comply. It does, however, have to come from someone. You cannot submit an anonymous allegation. So how does a person file an allegation? First of all, all allegations must be in writing, and the allegation must contain sufficient information about the museum and what the museum has or has not done. While you're probably ready to jump right into the mechanics of making an allegation, I think we need to back up just a bit. When I begin an investigation, I need to be sure of a couple of things. First of all, is the accused institution actually a museum under NAGPRA? The second thing is, does the museum have legal control over the items or human remains in question? So to get us started, what is a museum under NAGPRA? Under the Act, the term museum means any institution or state or local government agency, including any institution of higher learning, that receives federal funds and has possession of or control over Native American cultural items. This does not include the Smithsonian Institution or any other federal agency. So in some cases under this definition, an entity that calls itself a museum may in fact not be a museum at all. Then again, in some cases, an institution that does not consider itself to be a museum may, in fact, be a museum for the purpose of NAGPRA. This wonderful old place is the Burlingame General Store, located in the village of Freilick, Iowa. The store and surrounding grounds are owned and operated by the Freilick Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization set up to preserve the heritage of this tiny village of 14 people. Incidentally, it was here in 1892 that a man named John Freilich invented the first successful gasoline-powered tractor, which helped to usher in the American agricultural revolution of the 20th century. Now let's imagine for a moment that in one of these display cases inside the store is a sizable collection of Native American cultural items that local farmers have picked up over the years and donated to the foundation. Would the Freilich Foundation and the Burlingame General Store be a museum under NAGPRA? A good question, and the answer would be, it depends. If the Freilich Foundation has never received federal funds, it is not a museum under NAGPRA. It then follows to say that if the foundation never receives any type of federal funds, it will never be a museum under NAGPRA. Let's now imagine that the Freilich Foundation were to apply for and receive, let's say, a grant from the Department of Agriculture to, ironically enough, tell the story of tractors in agriculture. When the foundation receives that grant, it will have from that day forward met the federal funds criteria for being a museum under NAGPRA. But, you might say, 
the federal funds had nothing to do with Native American cultural items, and your observation would be absolutely correct. Under the law, excluding procurement contracts, receiving federal funds means receiving federal funds. It doesn't matter what the purpose of the funds was for, just that the funds themselves had a federal origin. In our technological age, finding out if an institution has received federal funds is much easier than it was in the past. If you have access to the internet, there are a number of useful websites that can help you learn who has received federal funds. A number of these sites are listed in the investigative support document found on the National NAGPRA website. Just click the Civil Penalties link on the home page and you'll find this and other helpful materials. So if you plan to make an allegation against an institution, it would be helpful if you can find out if the institution has received federal funds. Now let's have a look at that other threshold point, legal control. Imagine that you're a traditional religious leader of a Native American tribe and on your visit to the Freilich Foundation Museum, you see a special Native American heritage celebration display in the country store. And one of the items on display is a prayer stick, which happens to be one of your tribe's most sacred objects. In your tribe's traditions relating to the prayer stick, the object is inalienable. What I mean is that the object is of such significance that no tribal member would ever have the right to own or consequently the right to sell it. If you come from a Christian background, think about the church's, say, communion chalice. It's an object that belongs to a group of people, but not to any one individual. So upon returning home, you pass this information on within your tribal government. You know that the Freilich Foundation has received federal funds to tell the story of tractors and agriculture, so you know that the foundation has met the criteria of being a museum under NAGPRA. You check your tribal NAGPRA files and find no record of consultation with the foundation. Your tribal chairman then writes a letter to the foundation respectfully requesting talks about the prayer stick. The foundation responds saying that the items on display belong to another museum. Since the Freilich Foundation obviously is in possession of the prayer stick, the tribe files an allegation of failure to comply against the Freilich Foundation for not completing a summary that included the prayer stick. Would this allegation against the Freilich Foundation be substantiated? Based on what we have discussed so far, the answer would be no. Here's why. Even though the prayer stick was located on the grounds of the Freilich Foundation, it did not have legal control over the object. Under NAGPRA, legal control means having a legal interest in human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, or objects of cultural patrimony sufficient to lawfully permit the museum or federal agency to treat the objects as part of the collection for purposes of these regulations, whether or not the human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, or objects of cultural patrimony are in the physical custody of the museum or federal agency. When a museum or federal agency loans human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, or objects of cultural patrimony to another museum or federal agency, the party that loaned the items retains control of those items. So in this case, the party that controls the prayer stick is not the Freilich Foundation, but is the museum that loaned the item to the Freilich Foundation. So when you make an allegation against an institution, it's important that your allegation is made against the institution that controls the items that are subject to NAGPRA. Now, if you're not sure who actually controls the items uh, and you're concerned that asking too many questions will jeopardize the location of those items, your allegation is something that I will investigate, but just be aware that if the museum you name doesn't have legal control, your allegation may prove to be unfounded. Since we're talking about making allegations, let's touch on the allegation letter itself. While there are a number of steps you need to take when making an allegation, it's not a difficult process to follow and to do correctly. In fact, on the National NAGPRA website are template fill-in-the-blank documents and other supporting materials that have been developed to help anyone who wishes to make an allegation. 
I would encourage you to use these ready-made documents if you wish to file an allegation. Now, if you decide not to use one of these template letters, here are some important pointers you should consider when writing your allegation of failure to comply. First, be specific. If you believe, for example, that a museum has not completed an inventory of human remains in their possession, you need to state that in your letter. You need to say that XYZ Museum has not completed an inventory, and then provide some facts to support your claim. Supporting information can be obtained from the Federal Register website or through one of the many informational databases maintained on the National NAGPRA website. It's time now to have a look at some case studies. Like the television crime show where the crack investigative team discovers, investigates, solves, and successfully prosecutes complex cases in 52 minutes or less, our four case studies are compressed and distilled down to the essential elements so you can learn what is important to consider when making or addressing an allegation of failure to comply. If you want an investigation to proceed in a timely manner, you need to provide clear information that is specific to one or more of the eight ways in which a museum can fail to comply with the act. So let's take a look at some allegations, investigations, and findings. In our first case study, we'll examine a scenario that involved a museum that failed to meet the requirement of completing a summary of NAGPRA cultural items. This case was interesting to me for a couple of reasons. First, the museum was on record as having completed a number of summaries prior to the due dates for the collections that they controlled. Secondly, the allegation came from a museum employee, and that employee's allegation included photographs of unassociated funerary objects, copies of accession records, as well as copies of correspondence between the employee and museum officials. In that correspondence, the employee attempted to get the museum to deal with, as he put it, some unfinished NAGPRA business. These requests were not responded to, which led the employee to file an allegation and the museum getting a call from me. Case number one, violation allegation, failure to complete summaries as required by the Act. Your museum has failed to comply with the requirements of the Act if it after November 16, 1993, has not completed summaries as required by the Act. On August 15, 2007, I received an allegation that Cadwallader State University had not completed summaries as required by the Act. The allegation, which came from a university archaeology lab assistant, concerned what became known as the Dabney Collection. This allegation was complete with photographs, accession records, and specific descriptions of several unassociated funerary objects that were contained within the 6,000 plus piece collection. The university was not disputing its status as a museum under NAGPRA. In fact, my review of the National NAGPRA records indicated that in 1992, they had undertaken the summary process and, as required by the Act, had completed the summaries prior to the November 16, 1993 deadline. Strangely, however, there was no reference to any of the items that were alleged to exist in the Dabney Collection, nor was there any reference to the Dabney Collection itself. After a few unproductive conversations with archaeology lab staff, I set up a time to visit with the university's legal counsel, which proved both informative and illuminating. Yeah, legal. This is Tom. Hello, Tom. Bob Palmer here with the Department of Interior. Hi, Bob. I've been expecting your call. Well, I'm glad we could finally connect. Now, Tom, I'm hoping that you can help me out with uh, the matter that we've been corresponding about by via email. Now, as you know, I'm trying to understand uh, why the so-called Dabney Collection was never included in the summaries that were completed by the university back in 1993. Uh, can you shed any light on this for me? Yeah, well, after talking with the staff in the archaeology department, I think we've come to understand what's going on here. This probably won't surprise you, but there's no one left on staff in that department that was here back in 93. So we had to do some digging. And what we found was that when the summaries were completed back in 93, they apparently just missed a few items 
And as you know, the university did the summaries as required by NAGPRA. So I think what we have here is just a small oversight. Yes, I've, I've got copies of those summaries, Tom. Uh, but what I'm having trouble understanding is uh, that the Dabney collection contains about 6,000 items. Uh, the collection comes from a location that uh, isn't mentioned in any of the summaries completed by the university back in 1993. So, I mean, it would seem to me, Tom, that, you know, a 6,000 object collection would be kind of hard to miss. How many objects did you say there were? Well, according to the records I have, uh, the collection contains about 6,000 items, many of which are known to be unassociated funerary objects. Not only have I learned the size of the collection, but I also have some correspondence between the individual who made the allegation and um, Mr. Sims, who I believe is the current head of the archaeology lab. Yes. And that, that correspondence that I have indicates that uh, Mr. Sims was put on notice uh, by one of your employees two years ago uh, that something needed to be done, and, and yet nothing was done. And uh, this apparently was brought up with him again six months ago, and, and I don't find any record that anything's been done since then. Are you sure about this? It was my understanding that the university, the archaeology department, had simply missed including some of the items. Well, it, it does appear to me as though they, they did miss some items. I can provide you with copies of the collections accession records, uh, correspondence with Mr. Sims, if, if that would be helpful for you and, and the university to you know, learn what you need to do to come into compliance with NAGPRA. No, I don't think that's going to be necessary right now, Bob, but let me speak with the dean of the college about this. Can I get back in touch with you later today? Sure. Uh, you've got my phone number on the bottom of that email. Just give me a, give me a call when it's convenient. I should be here all day. Yeah, okay, will do. I'm sorry about this, Bob, uh, but I do want you to know that Cadwallader State University fully intends to comply with the law on this. And if we have or we are doing something that needs to be corrected, it will be corrected and we will be complying. Okay, okay. Well, just let me know if uh, you have any additional questions. And as I mentioned in my email, if you've got any technical questions, um, be sure to get a hold of the National NAGPRA program in Washington, D.C., and they can help you get on track as far as coming into compliance. We may be doing that. Thanks for your help. So did Cadwallader State University fail to comply with the act? In other words, did the museum fail to complete summaries as required by the act? Let's break this case down into its basic elements. First of all, was Cadwallader State University a museum as defined by NAGPRA? Answer, yes. The museum regularly receives federal funds and has collections of Native American items. It did not at any point contest their status of being a museum under the NAGPRA definition. Secondly, did the museum complete summaries of NAGPRA materials under their control by the due date? Answer, yes. In 1993, the museum had completed summaries of materials under their control. So was the allegation that the university failed to comply with NAGPRA substantiated? Answer, yes. But wait a minute. You just said that the museum met its NAGPRA obligations in 1993, and now you're saying that they're in violation of the act? Which is it? Under the summaries regulation, which can be found at 43 CFR 10.8b, the regulations clearly state that, and I quote, for each collection or portion of a collection, the summary must include an estimate of the number of objects in the collection or portion of the collection, a description of the kinds of objects included, references to the means, dates, and locations in which the collection or portion of the collection was acquired were readily ascertainable and information relevant to identifying lineal descendants, if available, and cultural affiliation. In this instance, the Dabney collection is a distinct and separate collection from the other collections under the control of the museum. Its contents, location, and number of objects are distinct and are different than the composition of the other collections that had been reported by the university. Failure to include this collection may have resulted in a tribe not receiving a summary letting it know that the museum had items that may be of interest to them. So, what was the end result with Cadwallader State University and the Dabney Collection? 
the university paid a civil penalty and worked with the National NAGPRA program in Washington, D.C. As a result, they sent out a completed summary, consulted with the tribes, and followed through to come into full compliance with NAGPRA. In our next example, we'll be looking at two distinct allegations made by one party against one museum. The allegations were that the museum did not complete a summary and had transferred NAGPRA items to a party not required to comply with the act. From an investigator's perspective, the following case is a good one to learn from. It had the elements of people from within the museum wanting to do the right thing set up against others whose judgment when viewed with the benefit of hindsight may not have been in the museum's best long-term interests. This case had an additional dimension that made it somewhat more complex. The museum had received both federal funds and the collection at different times many years after the act had went into effect. So in this case, we get to dissect the future applicability section of the regulations as they apply to a NAGPRA civil penalty case. Case number two, violation allegation, Museum failed to complete a required summary and transferred NAGPRA items contrary to the Act. Your museum has failed to comply with the requirements of the Act if it, after November 16, 1990, sells or otherwise transfers human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, or objects of cultural patrimony contrary to provisions of the Act, including, but not limited to, an unlawful sale or transfer to any individual or institution that is not required to comply with the Act. After November 16, 1993, has not completed summaries as required by the Act. On June 1, 2008, I received an allegation that the Linton Museum had not completed summaries as required by the Act and was attempting to evade NAGPRA compliance altogether by transferring the museum's collection of Native American cultural items to a group of individuals that were not required to comply with the Act. The collection in question was known as the Sailor Collection, and it contained thousands of Native American cultural items, including many unassociated funerary objects that had been collected over a period of more than 50 years. According to museum records and public documents which were provided to me by the party making the allegation, the Sailor Collection was donated with great fanfare by the Sailor family to the Linton Museum in 2002. At the time of the donation, the Linton Museum had not received federal funds and was not required to comply with NAGPRA. Five years later, in December 2007, the Linton Museum applied for and received federal funds in the form of a grant to the museum. During a board meeting in 2008, an exchange took place between two board members. So is there any further business left to discuss? As I've said before, and now I'm stating for the record, we are not in compliance with the NAGPRA law. We have the Sailor Collection. It was given to the museum. The collection contains funerary objects. We received federal government money last year to repair the roof of the museum. And now we are required to report to the government that we have Native American cultural items. We need to do a summary and deal with this now before someone complains. I think we should renegotiate the Sailor Collection loan with the Sailor family. What loan? What are you talking about? We need to renegotiate our existing agreement. We transfer the collection back to the Sailors and then take it back from them on a permanent loan. We renegotiate our existing loan. But it isn't and never was a loan. They donated that collection to the museum and you know it. It belongs to the museum. If it is ours, which I don't agree that it is, we just give it back to them and renegotiate. The collection never leaves the building. It's a paper exercise. We can't do that. It's against the law. At the very least, we're required to complete a summary of what we have. We're a small museum and nobody outside our community knows about us. And probably the only people within a hundred miles of here that have heard of NAGPRA are in this room. Besides, the feds aren't going to come looking for us. They've got other things to deal with. I make a motion that we contact the Sailor family and renegotiate the Sailor Collection loan. A motion has been made that the museum renegotiates the agreement with the Sailor family. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The motion passes. 
Later that month, an agreement was signed between the Linton Museum and the Sailor family, transferring ownership of the collection back to the Sailor family. The Sailor family then loaned the collection to the museum. Within a few days after the transfer, I received a very specific written allegation from the concerned Linton Museum board member stating that the museum had failed to comply with NAGPRA in two ways. It had made an illegal transfer and it had not completed the required summary. So had the museum violated NAGPRA by an illegal transfer and by not completing a summary of the Sailor collection? Let's look at the basic elements of the case. First of all, was the Linton Museum a museum under NAGPRA at the time of the transfer? Answer, yes. The Linton Museum received federal funds in December 2007, making it a museum under NAGPRA. The transfer of the cultural materials occurred in early 2008, so the institution was clearly a museum when the transfer occurred. The next consideration was, did the museum have legal control of the Sailor Collection? Answer, again, yes. While certain members of the board tried to suggest that the collection was on loan to the museum from the Sailor family, documents obtained during the course of the investigation clearly showed that the materials had been offered as a donation and that the museum had accepted the collection as a donation. So the museum was both in possession of and had control of the materials. Remember, control means having the ability to make decisions about use and ownership of the items. The final consideration of this potential violation was who did the museum transfer ownership to? And was the receiving party required to comply with the act? Answer, the museum transferred ownership to the Sailor family. The Sailor family is not a museum as defined by NAGPRA and therefore was not required to comply with the act. Consequently, the Linton Museum's transfer of the Sailor Collection represented a failure to comply with NAGPRA. Now let's turn our attention to the museum's requirement to complete a summary of cultural items. Did the Linton Museum violate this provision as well? Again, let's break it down. Since the Linton Museum was not a museum under NAGPRA until it received federal funds in 2007, the Sailor Collection is considered a new holding and falls under the Future Applicability Continuing Obligation to Comply section of the regulations found at 43 CFR 10.13. Since the Linton Museum received federal funds after November 16, 1995, the museum is required to complete a summary within three years of receiving federal funds. It received federal funds in 2007, so it had until 2010 to complete the summary. So the allegation that the Linton Museum did not complete a summary was not a violation at the time of the investigation, and that allegation was not substantiated. So what happened to the Sailor Collection in the end? The Linton Museum was found to have violated the act in that it had transferred Native American cultural items to a party that was not required to comply with the act. In this instance, the action was correctable and the museum and the Sailor family agreed to rescind the illegal transfer and comply with the act. Our third case study involves multiple allegations made by an individual from an Indian group that was registered in a state as a corporation. The person who made the allegation was a member of this group and claimed to be a lineal descendant from human remains being held by a museum. The allegation also claimed that the museum had not completed the required inventories of human remains, refused to consult with her as a lineal descendant, and refused to repatriate the human remains to her and the group that she was a member of. This case is informative on a number of fronts. It involves interests at the individual level as well as at the tribal level. It also reveals how consultation has worked and gets to some basic questions concerning what exactly is a lineal descendant under NAGPRA. Case number three, violation allegation number one, failure to complete inventories as required by the act. Violation allegation number two, refuses to repatriate. Violation allegation number three, failure to consult with tribes and or lineal descendants. Your museum has failed to comply with the requirements of the Act if it, after November 16, 1995, or the date specified in an extension issued by the Secretary, whichever is later, has not completed inventories as required by the Act. 
refuses, absent any of the exemptions specified in Section 10.10c of this part, to repatriate human remains, funerary object, sacred object, or object of cultural patrimony to a lineal descendant or culturally affiliated Indian tribe or native Hawaiian, does not consult with lineal descendants, Indian tribe officials, and traditional religious leaders as required. On July 18, 2006, I received an allegation that Gunder University had not complied with NAGPRA. The multiple count allegation, which was made by the Eastern Band of Fenua Indians, stated, among other things, that Gunder University possessed Native American human remains, had not completed inventories as required by the Act, did not consult with lineal descendants or with the Eastern Band of Fenua Indians. It also alleged that Gunder University refused to repatriate Native American human remains. The allegation, which came from Selma Johnson, Tribal Secretary for the Eastern Band of Fenua Indians, alleged that she was a direct lineal descendant of the individuals being held by Gunder University. She also alleged that despite repeated attempts on her part, Gunder University would not talk with her and lastly, Gunder University had not published an inventory of human remains that it had in its possession and control. The information provided for the investigation was pretty clear. Gunder University had received federal funds and was a museum under NAGPRA. So did Gunder University have in its possession or under its control Native American human remains? Ms. Johnson's allegation had been quite specific right down to the room in which the human remains were supposedly being stored, so her information appeared to be credible. A review of the National NAGPRA files found that Gunder University had completed a series of summaries of cultural items, but there were no record of any inventories of human remains. This seemed odd. Why would a museum complete the required summaries but not the required inventories? My initial thought was this. In some cases, Museums had been accused of not completing an inventory of human remains that were physically located at the museum, but are not under that museum's control. As can be the case, a museum may serve as a repository for another museum. When this happens, it remains the responsibility of the museum that has the legal control over the remains to complete the inventory. Another review of the National NAGPRA files failed to identify that Gunder University was serving as a repository, so now the real investigation began. Hello, Decker here. Oh, hello, Professor Decker. This is Bob Palmer with the Department of Interior. Hello, Bob. Dennis, as I mentioned in my email, I'm the NAGPRA Civil Penalties Investigator for the Department, and I'm calling you concerning an allegation that's been made against Gunder University regarding the human remains from the silo site. Uh, would you have a few minutes to talk to me? Sure, Bob. Uh, how can I help? Well, the allegation concerns some Native American human remains that I believe are in your possession and control. Now, from what I understand, uh, these human remains were excavated from a place called the silo site in the southeast part of the state by one of your faculty members back in 1966. Uh, are you familiar at all with this uh, project or with these remains? Well, yes, I, I certainly am. I, I was a graduate assistant on that project, and I know it very well. Oh, is that right? Well, sometimes when I do these investigations, the people connected with the allegation are sometimes they're long dead. Uh, I think probably your involvement uh, with the project will hopefully uh, help to move this along and resolve it more quickly. Well, I can assure you that I'm still very much alive. Now, can you tell me anything about the affiliation of the human remains from the site and any consultation work that the university's done to come into compliance with NAGPRA? Sure. Back in 1993, we brought down the Fenua tribe from upstate and had a very effective and constructive consultation with them. In the end, they blessed the remains and asked that we keep them here until the tribe was ready to uh, have them returned. We contact the tribal elders uh, every other year or two just to make sure that their feelings have not changed, and uh, well, that's about the status at this moment. Um, I'm interested. Do you have any dates associated with this site? Well, the, the site and the remains are somewhere between 600 and 800 years old. I, I'm not sure, but I think closer to 800, but I can't be sure about that. Okay, 6 to 800. All right. Were you able to affiliate the remains with any groups other than the Fenua tribe? 
No, the, the region around the silo site is the Fenua territory. All the evidence that we have here indicates that they were indeed Fenua. Okay, okay. Uh, the university doesn't possess any other human remains that are subject to NAGPRA? No, those, those are the only human remains that we possess. All right, well, here's what I'm trying to understand. I don't find a record that the university ever completed an inventory for this collection of human remains. And I've checked the Federal Register, I've checked the National NAGPRA office files, and I can't find anything. So can you help me out with this? Well, well, there should be one. Uh, it should have been done back in the early 1990s. Well, I haven't found any records for one. And from where I sit, and with the information that I have, it, it just doesn't appear as though the university ever followed through with and, and completed the inventory. Um, could you check your files and see if, if you can come across anything? Sure, I, I can give me, you know, just give me a couple of days and I'll be able to go through them. Okay, okay. Well, can I give you a call back on Friday? Oh, that'll be fine. I look forward to your call. Well, I'll speak to you then, and, and again, thanks for your help. Uh, not a problem. Goodbye. Later that week, Professor Decker stated that consultation with the Fenua tribe had taken place in 1993, but that Gunder University had not, in fact, completed the inventory and published it in the Federal Register. Okay, so let's take a look at where we stand. Now the investigation turned to the question of consultation. The museum was required to consult with lineal descendants as well as Indian tribe officials and traditional religious leaders that are, or are likely to be, culturally affiliated with the human remains. In my conversations with Professor Decker, he stated that Gunder University had consulted with the Fenua tribe, but had made no mention of any lineal descendant consultation. So, my investigation then turned to the Fenua tribe itself, as well as Miss Selma Johnson and the Eastern Band of Fenua Indians. Had the Fenua tribe really been consulted? Why had the Eastern Band of Fenua Indians not been included in consultation? What evidence of being a lineal descendant did Selma Johnson have? These were the key remaining questions. So I contacted Richard Farmer, traditional religious leader of the Fenua tribe. He confirmed that consultation had taken place in 1993, so Professor Decker's statements were confirmed to be credible. My investigation doesn't evaluate the success of consultation, I just look at whether there was or was not consultation activity. Next, I check the list of federally recognized tribes maintained by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. As it turned out, the Eastern Band of Fenua Indians is not a federally recognized tribe and therefore does not have legal standing as a tribe under NAGPRA. Next, I needed to speak with Ms. Selma Johnson, so I scheduled a phone interview to discuss her claim of being a lineal descendant. If her claim to being a lineal descendant could be supported, it would place her at the front of the line in terms of consultation. If she could back up her claim with the relevant facts, this case would take on a very different appearance. Hello? Good morning. May I speak with Miss Selma Johnson, please? This is her. Oh, hello, Miss Johnson. This is Bob Palmer with the Department of Interior. Hi, Bob. I've been waiting for your call. And call me Selma. Oh, well, thank you, Selma. And uh, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. I'm trying to finish up my investigation surrounding the allegation that you made against Gunder University, and I've got a few questions that I'm hoping you can answer. Sure, go ahead. Well, to begin with, in your allegation, you claim to be a lineal descendant of the people from the silo site. What can you tell me about this? Our people, the Eastern Band of Fenua Indians, have always been here. We're a subgroup of the Fenua tribe. When the Fenua tribe were forced out, a few of us hid and stayed behind. And we now make up the Eastern Band. We don't recognize that group from the north that calls themselves the Fenua tribe as the keepers of this land. They left and never came back. We are the true and rightful descendants of the ancient Fenua, and now we want to bring our ancestors home. Well, Selma, it's my goal to ensure that when I present my findings to the Assistant Secretary that he can make a correct determination based on the facts that exist. Now, the more specific and the more credible the information that you can provide me with, the more likely it is that his decision uh, will be the correct one. Now, you stated in your allegation letter that uh, you are a direct lineal descendant of the people from the silo site. Now, I need you to tell me about this direct connection. 
Now, of course, I appreciate that your people came from this land, but what I need to be able to show is your connection. You as an individual, uh, that you can trace your ancestry directly and without interruption to at least one of the sets of human remains that are being held down at Gunder University. Now, it, it doesn't have to be uh, records that are kept in the courthouse or anything like that. Uh, you can demonstrate this through the traditional means that your tribe uses, uh, but it has to be demonstrated. So does this make any sense? The silo site is where we have always buried our ancestors. Gunder University has our ancestors. We just want them returned to the land so they can continue their journey. Okay, well, I, I do understand that, and I certainly empathize with your hopes and desires. But at this point, for me to ensure that the law is being followed, I need to know if you can show a direct, unbroken connection uh, to the human remains from the silo site. Do you think that you can do that? Well, no, not to that level. I can't tell you their names, but they are my people. Well, I understand that. Uh, but for Nagpur to apply, Selma... Uh, in the case of a lineal descendant, you need to provide that connection. That It's a legal connection that's required by the law. And quite honestly, if it's not there, it's, it's not there. So if you can come up with some additional information, uh, get back in touch with me and, and uh, I'll consider that and put it into the report that I provide the Assistant Secretary with. Yeah, I'll do that. Well, thank you for your time, Selma. Goodbye. So what, in fact, was the outcome of the allegations? Once again, let's break the case down into its basic elements. First of all, was Gunder University a museum as defined by NAGPRA? Answer, yes. The museum regularly receives federal funds, had Native American items, and did not at any point contest their status of being a museum under the NAGPRA definition. Secondly, did the museum complete inventories of NAGPRA human remains under their control by the due date? Answer, no. Prior to the inventory due date and prior to the allegation, the museum had not published an inventory of human remains under their control. So this allegation made against Gunder University was substantiated. Next, did the museum refuse to repatriate human remains to a lineal descendant? Answer, no. While Ms. Selma Johnson claimed to be a lineal descendant, she was not able to substantiate her claim of having a direct, unbroken connection to the human remains from the silo site, so her allegation was not substantiated. Next, did the museum refuse to repatriate human remains to a culturally affiliated Indian tribe? Answer, no. The Southern Band of Fenua Indians were not a federally recognized tribe and therefore did not have standing to make a tribal repatriation claim under NAGPRA. So this allegation was not substantiated. Museums are encouraged to consult broadly, but no penalty exists for not consulting with Native American groups, as these are not federally recognized tribes. Our final case study involves an incident that from an investigator's point of view appeared to pop up out of nowhere. In this case, a small regional museum that employed no professional staff had in their possession American Indian human remains. The museum decided to have the human remains buried in a public ceremony by a group called the People of the Earth Tribe, and this was a non-federally recognized group. As it turns out, the planned ceremony was a surprise to the federally recognized tribes as well. This led to the tribe making four allegations against the museum. Case number four, violation allegation number one, failure to notify tribes within six months after completion of the inventory. Violation allegation number two, refusal to repatriate human remains. Violation allegation number three, repatriation of human remains prior to publishing a notice in the Federal Register. Violation allegation number four, failure to consult with Indian tribe officials. Your museum has failed to comply with the requirements of the Act if it, after May 16, 1996, or six months after completion of an inventory under an extension issued by the Secretary, whichever is later, has not notified culturally affiliated Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations, refuses, 
Absent any of the exemptions specified in Section 10.10c of this part to repatriate human remains, funerary object, sacred object, or object of cultural patrimony to a lineal descendant or culturally affiliated Indian tribe or native Hawaiian. Repatriates a human remains, funerary object, sacred object, or object of cultural patrimony before publishing the required notice in the Federal Register. Does not consult with lineal descendants, Indian tribe officials, and traditional religious leaders as required. On March 11, 2007, I received a telephone call from John Clark, tribal historian for the Tallymount Nation, a federally recognized tribe. A small regional museum in his home state, the Danger Bay Museum, was planning a repatriation and burial ceremony with the People of the Earth Tribe, which was a non-federally recognized group. Mr. Clark contacted the Danger Bay Museum by phone and learned that the remains were from traditional Tallymount territory and that the museum claimed to have completed an inventory. Mr. Clark then asked the museum to repatriate the human remains to the Tallymount Nation. They refused. Mr. Clark then checked the Tallymount Nation NAG profiles and found no record of the Danger Bay Museum contacting the tribe during the inventory process. Mr. Clark then contacted me by telephone and I directed him to the National NAGPRA website for details on how to file a written allegation. Since time was of the essence, I provided him with my fax number to expedite the process. Mr. Clark's letter from the Tallymount Nation provided good documentation to support most of his allegations. So upon receiving the letter, I made a call to Buck Shelford, Danger Bay Museum Director. Danger Bay Museum. Hello, may I speak with uh, Buck Shelford, please? This is Buck. Oh, hello, Mr. Shelford. My name is Bob Palmer, and I'm the civil penalties investigator with the Department of Interior under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. I'm calling concerning the burial and ceremony that you have planned for this weekend. Uh, do you have a few minutes to talk about this? Yeah, I guess so. Can you tell me what you've got planned? Sure. On Saturday, the people of the Earth Tribe are coming in. They're going to do a ceremony for us and rebury the Indian human remains that we have here at the museum. That's about it. I see. So you're planning to bury the remains on the museum grounds? Yes. I know this probably sounds like a strange question, but does the museum actually own the grounds uh, that you're planning to bury these people in? It sure does. Okay. Well, I, I've got a couple of questions that maybe you could clarify for me. Uh, from the information I have, the Danger Bay has received federal funds and is subject to comply with NAGPRA. Concerning these human remains, I understand that the museum has apparently uh, done an inventory and in that process affiliated the human remains with the Tallymount Nation. Is, is that correct? Yes, we did. We followed the law and did an inventory. Since the human remains came from traditional Tallymount territory, we affiliated the remains with the Tallymount at that time. Okay, so you've discussed the affiliation with the Tallymount Nation and also uh, your plans for the ceremony and burial? I sent them a letter a month ago telling them what we were doing. It stated that if I didn't hear back from them in two weeks, that our reburial would go ahead anyway. We didn't hear back from them in that time. So we're using the people of the Earth Group. They're our local Indian group here, so we decided to go with them. I see, I see. Okay. How are they connected with the Tallymount? What do you mean? I mean, has any member of the people of the Earth uh, told you that they're a lineal descendant of the remains uh, of the people that you plan to bury? Well, they say they're Indians, and the remains we have are Indians, so I guess they're related. I'm not too sure what you're trying to get at. Well, I'm just trying to learn if the people of the earth are directly related to the human remains. So, just to be sure I understand, you're giving the human remains to the people of the earth, is that correct? No, they're just ceremonially reburying them for us. You're not? Oh, okay. So what would you do if the people of the earth wanted to take the human remains and bury them somewhere else? The plan is to rebury them here on the grounds of the museum. So you're, you're not actually turning the human remains over to the people of the earth? No, they're just helping us rebury the, the remains. Look, are you trying to tell me we can't have our ceremony? I don't have the legal authority to stop your ceremony. 
Uh, what you do is, is up to you and what your legal counsel may believe is in the museum's best interest. Now, if you're looking for technical assistance with regards to NAGPRA, I think you'd be very well served to contact the National NAGPRA office in Washington, D.C. Uh, but now we still have some issues to work through in my investigation, but between your legal counsel, the National NAGPRA office, uh, we can probably get a better handle on where you stand. Well, we'll have to work this out then. Later that week, the people of the earth buried the human remains on the grounds of the Danger Bay Museum. So what in fact was the outcome of the investigation? For the last time, let's break a case down into its basic elements. To begin with, was the Danger Bay Museum a museum as defined by NAGPRA? Answer, yes. The museum had received federal funds possessed or controlled Native American items and did not at any point contest their status of being a museum under the NAGPRA definition. Next, had the Danger Bay Museum failed to notify culturally affiliated Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations as required by the Act? Answer, yes. Danger Bay's inventory determined there to be a cultural affiliation between the Native American human remains and the Tallymount Nation. When this inventory was completed, the museum had six months to send the Tallymount Nation its inventory and a notice of inventory completion. This it did not do. Next, had the Danger Bay Museum failed to consult with lineal descendants, Indian tribe officials, and traditional religious leaders as required? Answer, yes. Danger Bay had determined that the human remains that it possessed were culturally affiliated with the Tallymount Nation. But the museum offered no evidence, nor did I discover any in my investigation, that showed that they had actually contacted and talked about these human remains with anyone from the Tallymount Nation. Consequently, the museum was found to have failed to comply with the consultation provisions of NAGPRA. Next, did the Danger Bay Museum refuse to repatriate the human remains to a culturally affiliated Indian tribe or native Hawaiian? Answer, no. Mr. Clark of the Tallymount Nation had asked Mr. Shelford verbally to return the remains, but had never done so in writing, which is what the law actually requires. Consequently, the museum had not legally refused to repatriate the human remains to the Tallymount Nation. And lastly, did the Danger Bay Museum repatriate human remains before publishing the required notice in the Federal Register? Answer, no. While the museum had involved a non-federally recognized group in an event they called a ceremony, the event occurred on museum property and no facts were discovered to show that the museum transferred or repatriated the human remains to the people of the Earth tribe. The museum still had physical custody of the human remains and therefore had possession of them as the term possession is defined in the regulations. Thus, the museum did not repatriate the human remains. While the museum maintained custody of the human remains, they were buried, but on their land. Burying them on the grounds of the museum raised a whole series of questions and issues that went beyond the scope of NAGPRA civil penalties that has to do with care and use of an item involved in consultation. The last time I checked, those issues were being addressed by the tribe and the museum in other ways. Now that we have covered the investigative process and looked at a number of ways in which a museum can fail to comply with the Act, it's time to briefly discuss the financial penalties and how they are calculated. In many cases, aggrieved parties play an important part in this process. When the Secretary determines that a museum has failed to comply with the Act, a series of actions begin. These actions are outlined in the Federal Regulations at 43 CFR 10.12 or in the Investigative Support Documents on the National NAGPRA website. As this chart details, the civil penalty hearing and appeal process is twofold. First, as you can see, when a museum violates the Act, it is notified in writing. After receiving the notice, it has 45 days to request an administrative hearing, engage in informal discussions with the Assistant Secretary's representative, or waive its right to a hearing and accept the decision that it has failed to comply with the Act. As you can also see, 
If a hearing is requested and held, and the museum does not agree with the finding, then it has 30 days in which it can once again appeal the finding. Like with the first hearing, if the museum doesn't agree with the finding, it has 30 days in which it can appeal that decision to a federal district court. Informal discussions between NAGPRA Civil Penalties Coordinator and NAGPRA Attorneys can continue until the day of the hearing. If the museum feels it has legal or factual issues, the hearing gives them a chance to have an administrative law judge look at the case. If the issue is how to deal with compliance, the museum may want to move to compliance and focus on how to make the penalty as small as possible. Now, for the sake of our discussion, let's assume that a museum has been found to have failed to comply with the act and does not contest the finding. Then we are ready to go into the penalty phase cycle. The museum once again has the same avenue of administrative appeals available to it that it had in determining whether or not it failed to comply with the act. First, a notice of penalty assessment is sent to the museum in which the museum has 45 days to request a hearing, engage in informal discussions, or waive its right to a hearing and pay the assessment. As you can see on the chart, if a hearing is requested and held and the museum does not agree with the finding, it then has 30 days in which it can once again appeal the finding. Like with the first hearing, if the museum doesn't agree with the finding, it has 30 days in which it can appeal that decision to a federal district court. After adjudication in district court, and assuming that there are no further appeals, the penalty decision becomes final and the museum has 45 days in which to pay the penalty. If throughout the process the museum has not come into compliance with the act, an additional fine of up to $1,000 per day can be assessed until the museum does come into compliance. So how many dollars are we talking about for a museum that has failed to comply? Well, the actual penalty calculation is based on a number of criteria that are clearly spelled out in the regulations. The starting point is the annual budget of the museum. From this point, the penalty calculated must be 0.25 of a percent of the museum's annual budget or $5,000, whichever is less. And such additional sum as the secretary may determine is appropriate after taking into account such things as the archaeological, historical, or commercial value of the human remains, funerary object, sacred object, or object of cultural patrimony involved, the damages suffered, both economic and non-economic, by the aggrieved party or parties, including, but not limited to, expenditures by the aggrieved party to compel the museum to comply with the act, the number of violations that have occurred at the museum. Once this figure has been established, a penalty may be reduced if there is a determination that you did not willfully fail to comply, or an agreement by you to mitigate the violation, including, but not limited to, payment of restitution to the aggrieved party or parties, or a determination that you are unable to pay, provided that this factor may not apply if you have been previously found to have failed to comply with these regulations, or a determination that the penalty constitutes excessive punishment under the circumstances. So as you can see, the penalty calculation attempts to be inclusive of both aggravating and mitigating circumstances. From the perspective of a tribe or lineal descendant that has made an allegation, an important component of the aggravating circumstances calculation can be the damages suffered, both economic and non-economic, by the aggrieved party or parties, including, but not limited to, expenditures by the aggrieved party to compel the museum to comply with the act. When I finish investigating an allegation of failure to comply, I send potentially aggrieved parties a letter asking for information about the expenses that they incurred to compel the museum to comply with the act. This is where some problems can occur if good records of expenses are not kept. To include aggrieved party expenses, the costs need to be specific, such as receipts for attorney fees, telephone calls, or whatever damages can be clearly shown to be associated with compelling the museum to comply with the act. This cannot be best guessed costs. It needs to be the actual costs. So be sure to keep accurate records from the very beginning of the process. 
This detail of what is required is spelled out further on the actual letter, a copy of which is available on the National NAGPRA website. When we get to this stage in the discussion of civil penalties, the question that is most often on people's minds is, if you collect the penalty, where does the money go? Or does the tribe get the damages? The answer, again, is spelled out in the regulations. All penalty monies go into the general fund of the United States Treasury. In some cases, as noted in the penalty reduction criteria, a penalty might be mitigated if, for example, a museum and tribe independently came to an agreement where the museum paid costs to the tribe that it incurred compelling the museum to comply with the act. These possible arrangements are, however, between the museum and the aggrieved party. The government is not involved in any such arrangement. As I tell museums that I'm investigating, the goal of the civil penalty provisions of NAGPRA is not to hammer them with a fine, but rather to ensure compliance with the law. Consultation is part of compliance. Completing inventories and summaries is part of compliance, as is repatriation. Even after an allegation is made or finding of noncompliance is made by the Secretary of the Interior, it is best to come into compliance sooner rather than later. The whole civil penalty process and investigation stance is geared towards encouraging compliance. While I would be hard-pressed to characterize the filing of a civil penalty allegation as a happy occasion for either party, sometimes just the filing of an allegation has served as an effective and valuable reset point for museums and tribes involved in the NAGPRA civil penalty process. Occasionally, the reset comes about through increased knowledge of the law by the museum. In other cases, the reset has come when a museum has been found to have failed to comply with the act itself. Whatever the circumstances, the goal of the civil penalty process remains the same, and that is moving the process forward towards greater compliance with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Thanks for watching. I guess I want to say thank you to, to Congress for giving us NAGPRA. And I say it. <laughs> I say it in a, a weird way because I, I say it laughing like that because there's, there is criticism in Indian country of NAGPRA, but, um, and although I will sit here and tell you about the 123,000 sets of ancestral remains that haven't come home and this work that needs to be done, I can also tell you about, you know, the other sets of remains that have come home and so, and, and the, setting this process um, into place. I think it's humbled me a lot because I had a lot of assumptions about what I thought I knew as an archaeologist and as a scientist and as a woman. And, uh, it has humbled me. I've been privileged to take part in events that I never would have imagined taking part in. And I've built some deep, lasting friendships and it's really helped me to uh, gain empathy for understanding belief systems that are not my own. And that's what's really, I think, important in a struggle with this is that I've heard so many times people say, well, what's the big deal? If it were my grandmother, I wouldn't care. Well, the big deal is it's not your grandmother, it's someone else's grandmother and they do care. You know, and so I think building empathy is, and under, cross-cultural understanding has been pretty pivotal for me. The last we burial I did was, it was January. We just got the remains back. And it was from a disposition. And I was like, oh man, I don't want to have these hanging out in my office all winter, you know. So I got my snowshoes on and uh, threw them on my back, you know, and I had the shovel and I was like trekking through the woods and I was like, I hope the ground's unfroze. If not, I'm going to have to start a fire. But luckily, I started digging and the ground was unfrozen. You know, it's just like, cool, you know, you feel really good. You know, you're reburying and, and the remains were all kids, you know, just like little itty bitty skulls and just little guys, you know. And they're from right down where I grew up in Mackinac City, which is like 20 miles from Cross Village. So this is like real personal. And it's like felt really good, you know, it's like I did something good today. You know, this is like something I can be proud of. I call my mom and she's all happy. Tell other people, I was like, oh, that's, that's a good thing.